Okay, so yeah, so Ed, uh, if you don't mind, give your introduction and then you can start with your opening statement because we are really running um, late, yeah. Yes, can everyone hear me? Well, I hope so. Please pardon the technical difficulties. We had just a little um, technical backslide that kind of held us up, but um, we're going to try something and hopefully everyone can hear me and everyone can get me clear, but we're going to try um, a different route to get this done today. Um, let me thank everyone that's on for coming forward. And let me also thank my brother, um, OJ, for being a part of this so that we can have this dialogue, that we can move forward um, to, with the understanding um, that we're going to receive today. Amen. We're going to have this dialogue concerning the law and must do must new testament believers um observe to the torah to the law which i say yes they must amen and will prove that they um have scripturally and historically um to show that the church kept the torah and observed the torah um way into the fourth century so we want to be able to prove that and show that today um on with my brother oj we're going to do so so um am i supposed to go into it or is this the beginning statement or i'm, I'm not quite sure oj yes 15 minutes opening statement so so you have 15 minutes uh opening statement unfortunately okay let me see if i can bring this out through the speakers um uh, there might be some feedback because you might not be hearing uh, josiah but let me see um if I bring this out through the speakers, you might hear him. Yes, yeah, so you have 15 minutes to give your opening statement, your opening statement, and I will have 15 minutes to also give my opening statement, after which you have your 10 minutes to rebut, and I will have 10 minutes to rebut. Then we'll have another five minutes to rebut, and you have another five minutes to rebut, and then we'll go into the, just like you saw in the chat, we'll go into the cross-examination, which is 10, 10 minutes, and then five, five minutes, and then we have the closing uh, statement, and then people could ask questions. Closing statement for five. So you could you could go. You have five minutes now. And Josiah is going to be timing that. Once you start, you have fifteen minutes to make your case before I start. Yeah. Is so that, I have fifteen minutes now, or that was on my time. No, you have fifteen you, minutes for an opening statement. Okay, I heard him. I have fifteen minutes. Start it now. Yes. Yes. When you start, when All you right. when you start, your, your time starts. Okay, I'll start now. I'll start now. Um, first and foremost, let me apologize for the technical difficulty. It was purely on my end. Uh, we had some technical difficulties there. However, we were able to work something out, and I do pray and hope that everyone can hear me. And we are going to start off at this point in time uh, with my fifteen minutes. Um, first, I would always like to give praise to the Most High God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, who have always um, blessed us with his light, with his word, and we pray that he bless us at this point and at this time to bring his light into this dialogue so that the listeners can be edified. We're speaking concerning the law, and must New Testament followers observe the law, the Torah? Yes, they must. Amen. They must follow the law of the Torah, and they did, amen, according to history and according to the scriptures. Now, to show a gentleman by the name of Sozomon, all right, Sozomon, S-O-Z-O-M-E-N, all right, he is a Roman historian, 450 A.D., amen, and he chronicled the church and its growth and followed it for some time, amen, and this is what he said concerning the church, 450 AD, he said, and I quote, for all the churches assemble and observe the Sabbath, except for the Romans and the Alexandrians in Egypt. All right, this was Sozomen, S O Z O M E N, 450 AD, a Roman historian that was writing concerning Jesus Christ's followers and the growth that they took that they did at that point in time. This is 450 AD, amen, way after the death and resurrection of Christ and way after the times of the apostle. This is a Roman historian 
that his right to that he states all the churches amen gather and assemble on the seventh day sabbath all right except for the romans and the alexandrians in egypt now we know why the romans and the alexandrians because we we have historical evidence that the church did you hear me yes we can hear you now Go on. okay okay yes so 450 a.d we have historical proof that the church still observed the Torah. They were still Sabbath keepers. Amen. They were still Sabbath keepers. Also, we have another historian, and this is not just an historian, but he's an, a, a disciple of John the Apostle. His name is Ignatius, all right? Uh, we can please look him up. He states, all right, uh, let us therefore no longer keep the Sabbath after the manner of the Jews. In rejoicing in days of idleness amen but let everyone keep the Sabbath after a spiritual manner rejoicing and up uh, and studying on the Torah the law amen this is Ignatius amen 140 about 145 AD all right this is Ignatius all right this is historical proof that after Christ died, resurrected, amen, after the times of the apostles, amen, early church followers still kept the Sabbath all the way until about eight, about 450, we have records showing that the church kept and acknowledged the Sabbath. No Sunday, they observe Torah. They follow Torah because Torah commands us to keep the Sabbath and we kept the Sabbath, amen? All through the scriptures, we see that Christ kept the Sabbath. The apostle Paul kept the Sabbath. We see this through scriptures. But the reason I'm quoting history first, amen? The reason I'm quoting history first is because we can argue all day concerning um, the interpretation of scriptures. What this mean and what that means, someone can say, well, the Apostle Paul went to the Sabbath only to convert Jews. He was not really a Sabbath keeper. I, I've heard it all before. But history shows us exactly what the church did. And they were Sabbath keepers. Amen. Not only did Ignatius tell us to keep the Sabbath, he said that on the Sabbath, let us meditate on the law. Let's think about the Torah. Amen. This is what the church delivered all all the way up until 450 AD, amen. And we know after 325 what took place and what came in and what was ushered in. And here we have today where the Sabbath is today ignored, but it was not ignored by the early church. It was not ignored by the, those that followed um, the apostles at the beginning, first, second, third, and late into the fourth century. It was not ignored. They still observe Torah. Amen. Now, let me get something extra across. Torah is the instructions from God. Amen. The instructions that God gave to Moses and also instructions that God gave to Christ Jesus. This is Torah. This is the Torah. So we don't want to say, oh, it's Moses writing. We don't have to follow Moses writing. Amen. It is God that wrote it with his finger and gave it to Moses. Amen. So when we say we don't, we don't have to follow Moses' law, we're saying we don't have to follow God's law. Amen. And let us be clear as we listen and study today. If we say we are not murderers, we don't steal. Amen. We honor our parents. Amen. We are saying we observe Torah. Amen. Let us not say, oh, I don't keep Torah, but it's in my heart not to steal. It's in my heart not to kill. It is in your heart because you observe Torah. Amen. This is why it is there. So we must have that understanding clearly concerning the law. Now let's go into the scriptures briefly with the time that I have left. Amen. Before my brother comes on and brings his delivery. Let's look first at, at what Christ said concerning the law. Let's make sure we understand that crystal clear that Jesus Christ taught concerning the law. Amen. I'm going to go to St. Matthew 19 and I'm going to start at verses 16. 
Now, we want to pay very close attention to this. We would like to pay very close attention to this. Jesus Christ, uh, the scripture teaches us, and behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Okay. But if thou would enter into life, keep the commandments. Amen. Keep the commandments. He said unto him, which Jesus says, thou shalt not murder. Amen. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbors as thyself. What was Christ doing? He was pointing to the Torah. He was pointing to the Torah. This was not nothing new that Christ brought. This was nothing new that Christ invented. Amen. The young man said, oh, I have kept thee. And Christ proved to him that he didn't keep it. Christ said, if you keep it, then go sell what you have and, and give it to the poor. And the scripture t tells us that the young man went away very sad. And why? Because the law tells us to love thy neighbor as thyself. The same way you feed yourself, the same way you clothe yourself, do for your fellow brothers, do for your neighbor. And the young man just wasn't willing to go to that point. He was just saying he kept the law. But Christ proved to him immediately that he was not a keeper of the law. But let us not forget what Christ said to the young man. If you will enter into life, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. You must observe Torah. You must keep the law. All right. Nowhere do we see where it says, oh, um, we can kill, we can steal. We can do this. No, we don't see that in divine scripture. Amen. Let's go to the Apostle Paul. Amen. Let's go see what the Apostle Paul says. Now, please keep in mind, this is after the death and resurrection of Christ. This is after the death and resurrection of Christ. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. Romans, the third chapter. We're going to read verse 31. Listen to what Paul says. Do we then make void the law? Do we do away with the law? Uh, no. Do we then make void the law through faith? Amen. This is what some people say. You don't need the law. All you need is faith. This is what some teach. But listen to what the apostle Paul is saying to the church. Amen. The church at Rome. Amen. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. We must establish the law in our everyday lives. This is what the Apostle Paul is teaching. Let me go one step further because I, I know I'm pressed for time and I know I, I, I held back some time also, you know, with the technical difficulty that I had. Again, let me apologize for that. I'm very glad for my brother to be able to work a few things out so that I could be able to be on. Now, Romans 7, amen. Romans 7, I'm going to read verses 12. Listen to the Apostle Paul, all right? Wherefore the law is holy and the commandments holy and just and good amen why do we want to do away with that which is just which is holy and which is good we must establish it it must be established in our lives it must be um, observed in our lives everything that is good comes from god that which is holy comes from god that which is just come from god and we must observe it. So to say we do not have to observe Torah is to say it is all right for us to kill. It's to say it is all right for us to murder. All right. This is exactly what you're saying. And it can be disguised in many ways. No, no, that's not what we're saying. If you're not saying that, then you're saying we have to observe Torah. Amen. If you're not saying that it is not OK for us to kill. Amen. And it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's beyond the Ten Commandments. If you're saying if you're saying that a man can marry an animal or if you're saying he cannot marry an animal, it is because it is recorded in God's law. If you're saying a, a mother cannot marry her son, you're saying that because it is recorded in God's law. Amen. So let's not. Oh, it's just the Ten and no, it's just we observe Torah. The early church observed the Torah. History shows that they observed it all the way until about 450. We understand what took place, 321, the first council of Nassim. We know what was introduced and everything that came hereafter that have, have us 
in the situation we are today. But the apostles showed clearly after the death and resurrection of Christ that they still observed the Torah, that they still kept the Sabbath day, they still kept the feast days. And these are the things that I am putting forward today that we understand, that we acknowledge, and that we pay very close attention to. This is the only cure to bring the earth out of the darkness it is in, because man have turned against the laws of God. And this is the only light that can be shined in this dark world. It is the laws of the Most High God. What are we saying we are, how can we say we are obedient to God? We are obedient children. What are you obedient to? If not his laws, his statutes, his commandments, what are you obedient to? We must be obedient to his word. We must put that forward and be very clear concerning that. Um, how much more time do I have? Sorry. Uh, one minute remaining. Did one you, minute remaining. Did you one take into consideration remaining. those lapses too? You might want to give him some more time. Yes, yes, yes. yes. A matter of fact, I would do so. I would yield the rest of the time. Um, the one minute that I have, I, I would yield that um, so that my brother can come forward and put forward his presentation. Thanks very much, Ed. OJ, when you get when you want to start, 15 minutes for you. Opening statement. Okay, I want to. Okay, can you bring me on? Okay, that's that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Okay, uh, yeah. So I'm ready to start. Um, so I want to thank, uh, first of all, I just want to quickly thank um, Ed for um, also honoring this. And I know you had some technical issues, but I'm, hope, I'm hoping that um, at the end of the day, God himself will be glorified. I'm pressed for time. I have a lot to cover, so I'll just jump right into it. Okay, so the issue here is, should New Testament, uh, should, should New Testament believers observe, of, of, observe the Torah? And I'll be arguing in the negative, definitely not. But I want to cover these issues as I address the issues. As I address this topic, so I would like to us to see what the Torah is in the context of this debate, why the topic is important, why the Torah was given, uh, did Jesus come to abolish the Torah, and why New, New, Test New Testament or Covenant believers should not um, are not required to observe the Torah. So, for me, what is the Torah in the context of this debate? It's important to make it clear that in the context of this debate, when we speak about the Torah, we are not just speaking about a gener generic set of instructions from God or Christ. We are specifically referring to the compilation of all the instructions given to God to the Israelites in the first five books of the scriptures, which became binding as law to be observed by the Israelites. Because if, if he says Torah is instructions from Christ, then we're not going to have any problems. But right now, it's important we, we actually restrict it to what we know as the Torah. So in simple terms, the Cambridge Dictionary says Torah is the first five books of the Jewish Bible that deal with the law of God. And, and these laws have been generally agreed upon to be 613 in all. All right, so why is this important? This topic is important to me and I believe should be to everyone because it is deemed to be a salvation issue to many Hebrew Israelites who do not regard the New Testament as valid and other Hebrew Israelites and Torah observant believers like Ed who also believed in the validity of the New Testament uh, believing Yeshua or Jesus, Jesus is the biblical Messiah, son of God, and that his teachings alongside the New Testament authors are valid and inspired by God. This is also important because not only is the liberty of the saints in Christ being called into question, as was in the days of the apostles, um, such as we see in Acts 15, it also brings many hybrid believers, like which I believe Ed is a part of them, into the potential judgment and condemnation who attempt to put new wine into old skin by teaching New Testament believers cannot be saved if they do not observe the Torah. We'll see from the scriptures that such a person is clearly shown to have fallen from grace and cut themselves off from Christ. All right, so some really lead up to the Torah, just to see how we got here. God chose a man, Abraham, from a people, made a covenant with him. God made a promise. And through his seed, he said, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Note that even before this was sealed with the covenant of circumcision, the law which came 430 years later, Abraham was already considered righteous on the basis of faith he expressed towards God and not on the basis of, any, of covenant of circumcision, uh, circumcision or the law. This is very keen understanding why we are not children of Abraham but on the basis of the Torah, but on the basis of grace through faith in Christ. Later, Abraham's descendants became slaves in Egypt and God then uh, um, used the man called Moses to deliver them. In the course of establishing them in their land, um, which God had promised to them, God then gave Moses these binding laws to govern 
uh, how the Israelites, not Gentiles, were to live, and we'll come to know, uh, which we have come to now know as the Torah. Okay, so why was the Torah given? Torah was given according to the scriptures as a guidance to lead us to the real thing, which is Christ. Um, we see that many aspects of the Torah also represented types and shadows of the real thing, which had, had which had its culmination and accomplishment in the finished works of Christ. Thus, with regard to the above, Paul clearly stated in Galatians 3.23, uh, 3, uh, 20, but before faith came, we were kept on in custody under the law, being confined for faith that was destined to be revealed. So this was a temporary thing. Then it goes on to explicitly state, therefore the law has become our guardian to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. This is very key in refuting what Ed is arguing for. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. That is clearly stated. You can't say we are still under the guardian after faith had come. It says, for you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have, have, um, have clothed yourself in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female for you are one, one in Christ. In Colossians 2.16, he goes on to say, Therefore no man is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect of a festival, uh, uh, of a festival new moon or a Sabbath day. You see what he was saying, that we should observe the, the Sabbath. But he's saying, no, you cannot be judged on the basis of this. He says what? Things which are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. All right. So the question is that, did Christ come to abolish the Torah? Now, this question must be answered in the right context. Indeed, Christ did not come to abolish the Torah in its essence, but fulfill the true essence of the Torah. Thus, he definitely came to abolish the letter and rituals of the Torah uh, that was devoid of its true essence, as, as we'll get to see. The, the NLT helps us to um, see and understand this very clearly in Matthew 5, 17. Christ says, uh, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. You see the whole thing. So this is the context of the uh, Christ fulfilling uh, the, the, the law. Not that he came to uh, just fulfill the rituals of the law, like Ed may be ask, asking us to do. He came to accomplish the true essence. I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, even the smallest detail of God's law, um, uh, even the, the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. This is key, until its purpose is achieved. The question is that, has Christ fulfilled the law? Yes, he has. So, therefore, we are no longer under the law. So if um, um, Christ goes on to say, so if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of God. But anyone who obeys God's law and teaches them will be called the greatest. So we see that in the same chapter, Matthew, Jesus goes on to sometimes revise, expand, explain, context, and even make tougher. And at other times, completely overturn the old, uh, old covenant Torah laws pertaining to uh, things like lethal violence, um, divorce, marriage. And we'll see that um, 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 very shortly. Um, yeah, so if the rituals of, uh, or the letters of the law were not done away with, how do you explain the changes below? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, now becoming, you know, turn the other cheek and love your enemies. You see here that Christ says, uh, if we go back to Exodus 21, where a pregnant woman was injured, if she lost her life, you have to take life. If it was an eye, it was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, and all that. But see what uh, Christ is saying, um, how Christ, Christ uh, uh, clearly uh, changes this. In, um, um, we also see that it was written, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But now he says, love your enemies. The question is, how do you go from hate your enemies to love your enemies? I want Ed, Ed to be able to meaningfully explain this if there was no change in the law and we're supposed to uh, continue in this vein. How are, we, how are we supposed to do this? <clears throat> so you see here that even David, Christ talked about uh, how David uh, uh, and the priests, they break the commandment and they're innocent. Like when David went to eat, what was not lawful for him to eat, but he was deemed innocent, just like the priest. Um, um, also, the, Bi the Bible says uh, um, in um, 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 Matthew chapter 12, verse 3, have you not read that David did, uh, what David did when he and his companions were hungry, he entered the house of God, um, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, um, um, which was not lawful to eat. Then he also went, went on to say, have you not read in the law that the Sabbath, uh, the law on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath, and yet they are innocent. So, um, Ed, we have to explain all these things, and this is why we say that New Testament believers are not are not uh, uh, obliged to observe the Torah. Verse 7 says, if only you had known the meaning of, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. 
So you see that, that these were breaking the rituals of the Sabbath, but in the essence, they were justified. So um, we see the summary here that it should be clear that Christ did not come to uphold or fulfill the rituals of the law, but to fulfill the essence of the law uh, by giving the law uh, by giving the law its true meaning and purpose. And since Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given, the result is that all who believe in Christ are made right with God through faith in Christ, just like Abraham was made righteous by his faith in God outside the context of the law. Therefore, all who express faith in the finished works of Christ and obey Jesus, not Moses, are, not, are, are made right with God. Again, we would see this as being uh, crystal clear as we go forward. Um, so this is why New Testament Christians should not um, obey, the, uh, they are not required to go through, are not required to observe the Torah. And I'm going to be very quick about this and I'll just give the summary because time is really fleeting. Is that when uh, um, Jesus tells Ananias here that he had already ordained Paul, that Paul was his instrument. When Peter saw this vision about uh, killing birds to eat, he considered them unclean. But again, you see the voice came in Acts chapter 10 and says, again, the voice said, what God has cleansed, no one should call unclean. So these are things that, tell, that clearly tell us that there's a change. Indeed, there's a change in law. And Peter's response to the men from Colonial's household, he said to them, you were aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure. So this clearly tells you that things were changing. Paul was, uh, Peter uh, uh, was criticized by Jewish believers by even going to uh, eat with the Gentiles. But see, when Paul exhorts the Jews in Antioch, in the synagogue, this was what he said. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through, through him, that's Jesus, forgiveness, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not, you could not be free through the law of Moses. So clearly you see that there's a difference here. Therefore, see that See, see that the things spoken of the prophets do not uh, come upon you. So we see in the book of Acts in, in, in the Council of Jerusalem, this is what clearly I believe just um, um, refutes uh, the argument of, 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 um, of Ed here. Some men came down from Judea saying, unless you be circumcised, you will not be saved. Right? And that's exactly what he's saying. If we don't follow the Torah, you will not be saved. But, but look at what happens in verse 2 here. And Paul and Barnabas had a heated argument with them. Why were they debating? Why were they debating them? Then they could have just said, "Oh yes, it's true. You should observe the Torah." They were debating them because they knew the context of the new covenant does not require the believer to observe these rituals. And again, see, verse five says, "The sect of the Pharisee who had believed stood up. It is, it is, it is necessary to circumcise them and direct them to up, up, to keep the law." This is what Eddie, 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 this is what Ed is arguing for. But Peter spoke and said. Because of time, I'm just going to go through this. He said, brothers, you know how in the early days God made a choice amongst me to bring the word to the Gentiles. He said this, why are you putting God to the test? That's exactly what Ed, Ed is doing. Why are you putting God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor uh, we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in the same way as they are. James also gi gives his counsel and says, how did they reconcile this in the end? They said, therefore, it is my judgment that we do not cause trouble for them from the Gentiles who turn, who are turning from God, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contain, uh, contaminated by idols, from acts of sexual immorality, from what has been strangled and from blood. So these are the, they gave them these four requirements. And in the Council of Jerusalem, so we see James, Peter, the elders, elders also met, and they also wrote to the, 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 the Gentiles and said, um, the apostles and the brothers who... <clears throat> Who are the elders to so the brothers and sisters in Antioch who, who are from the Gentiles? Since we have heard that some of our members of whom we gave no instructions have confused you by their teaching of setting your souls, for it is good uh, to us and the Holy Spirit to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. And we have to prove to me that, oh, it, you know, that there was no time that they said, oh, well, it's just for a while. In the future, there'll be more. Okay? No, these essentials, and they told them what they are that you abstain from things strangled blood and the immorality from from these things you will do well so it's very clear paul uh circumcised Timothy, as we could see out of uh um, because of out of pressure not because he had to do so even the jailer when he was asked what must i do to be saved he said except you know believe in the lord jesus christ and you'll be saved you know there's so much more i have to cover but i don't know if the time will permit me maybe in the rebuttal section session i'll just use that to cover that but paul uh you could see that paul did not continue even on in the law he did not continue, but he was compelled to do that because of James and the rest of them, not because he followed the law. If we go to Romans, we'll see where the Bible clearly says the Gentiles who do not have the law instinctively perform the law. Okay, so they, they do that because they have the spirit of God. They don't follow the law. How would you explain that if they don't have the law, then how can they perform it? You see that? 
in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. And that is in line with the new covenant. All right. Um, when we go to, um, there's so much more in Romans. Um, if we go to Galatians, I think I would like to go to Galatians because I think that is the real crux of the matter. In Galatians, Paul makes it very, very clear. You know, he notes that he was amazed that people were going back to try to uh, observe the law and he was chiding them. He talked about the slave and the free woman, woman as how those who have the promises are the free ones and, and the Ishmael and Haggai were those under bondage. He spoke about all these things. And in Galatians, he, he clearly stated in, in Galatians 5, 2, he said, look, Paul, I tell you, if you yourselves are circumcised, Christ will not benefit you anything. He will not benefit, benefit you anything. I testify again to every man who has himself circumcised that he is obliged to keep the law, just like Ed is applied to keep the law. You have been severed from Christ. You are, you are seeking to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. That is a very, very serious thing. How many minutes do I have? How many minutes do I have? You have uh, one minute left. All right. I, there's so much to say, but I'll look at it. But in summary, what we see is that Christ did not come to abolish the law. Quite all right. But he didn't come to uphold the rituals of the law. He came to fulfill them. And anyone in the, who is in Christ or it's, it's free from the law. We walk by the law of the spirit of Christ. Uh, Christ. We don't walk by the law of, of Moses. Galatians chapter 3, 23 tells us that the law was, we were kept in custody until the real thing came, which was Christ. So we have no obligation to do that. Those who seek to be justified by the law have fallen from grace. As the scriptures say, they've cut themselves off from Christ, which is a very dangerous thing. You find out with Eddie. And Galatians 5, 3 tells us Christ will profit us nothing. So we see very clearly that if we walk by the law of the spirit of Christ, then we are not under the law, as the scriptures clearly says. And they were not under any obligation, according to the New Testament church, for them to observe um, the, the Torah. So I think I will leave it at that, based on the time I have. Okay. Thank you, OJ, for that opening statement. Now we have a first rebuttal for 10 minutes. Is Ed ready? Ed, Ed are you still with us? Ed, are you here? Sorry, let me see. Uh, I think I lost him. Thanks, everyone, for the comments. I didn't. I didn't show them when OJ was presenting because it would obscure his view. Yes, um, but it's great to see. Um, yeah, I can hear you. Did you? It seems like I lost you. Did you hear my opening statement? You should have called back though if I lost you because. Are you there? Yeah, I, I heard it. I, I heard it. Oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah, it seems like we lost you. So, Josiah, um, I think it's your time for your 10 minutes uh, rebuttal. Yes, 10 minutes, whenever you're ready to start. Okay. 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 I have my 10 minutes now? Yes. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, pardon the technical difficulties that um, I'm having here. Um, I'll try to work through it and um, get to where we have to be. Now, I just want to respond to a few things my brother said. He said that the Torah is only what came by Moses, is not what came by Jesus Christ. Now, I showed you already where the young man asked Jesus Christ, what must I do to inherit life? Amen. This is what the young man asked Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ told him plainly, you have to keep the Torah. He pointed to the Torah and showed him. So for you to say that Jesus Christ didn't break the Torah um, is going clearly against scripture. Now, this is what Jesus said in St. John, the 12th chapter, verse 49 and 50. This is what Jesus says. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life eternal, all right? It is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So what we see here, the same God, our Heavenly Father, that gave these instructions to Moses is given these instructions to Christ Jesus. How do we know it's the same? The young man asked Christ Jesus, what must I do? And Christ Jesus pointed to what Moses had written. He didn't say, well, listen, I got some brand new stuff for you here. Let's not, let's ignore what Moses had. He did not. He pointed 
to the commandments that God gave to Moses that was written in the law. This is clear. So when we say, oh, um, Christ came and gave some new stuff, where? Where is the list of, of these new laws that Christ gave? Please show it. All right? Please show it. All right? So, again, he said, um, he went to Galatians 3. Um, he went to Galatians 3, and um, he, he didn't come all the way down, and I know why, but let, let me point here. Um, Galatians 3, uh, I think he, he read 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that the faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Now, is, is this speaking concerning all the laws or a particular law? All right, let's assume it is speaking about all the laws and that once Christ came, all the laws are now removed and we don't have to follow them. Then what you're saying is that we can kill, we can commit adultery, amen, we can um, accept homosexuality, all right, we can accept bestiality. This is what you're saying if you're interpreting this scripture as when Christ came, we no longer need the law. And that is not what it is saying. Listen what it is clearly saying here. If we go back up some, verses 19. Wherefore, servant the law, it was added because of transgression till the seed should come. What law was added? What law was added for transgressions? This is talking about the sacrificial laws. These laws was added for transgression to keep us until the perfect sacrifice came which was Christ, and these laws was removed. This is what Paul is speaking about. Paul is not saying all the laws are thrown out the window. No way. No way is he saying that. Amen? Then he went on, um, I think, to Colossians um, there, where he said that we are um, not supposed to judge. The scripture didn't say the Sabbaths and the feast days was removed. It didn't say that. It simply said, let no man judge you concerning the meats and concerning the offerings, on which things are a, a shadow to come. These things are crystal clear. What the brother um, tried to make it seem as though it is saying all, all the laws are, have been thrown out of the window. And please let me be able um, to show that is not what is being said. He said so many things that I would like to address, um, but I hope I have all the time to address it so that I can clearly put it forward. Um, what, what is my time? What time do I have left? Uh, five minutes left remaining. Oh, good. Oh, good. I have five minutes left. All right. So he said that in the scripture where it says, let no man therefore judge thee, all right, due to drinks and meat, all right, or in respect of a holy day. What is that speaking of? Now, in, in the, under the Torah, where we kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath had to be kept um, with certain sacrifices, you had to bring forth certain sacrifices to keep um, the Sabbath. Let, let us go back briefly so that we can be able to see this and have a clear understanding as to what was put forward um, concerning how we kept the Sabbath under the law of Moses. Now, the, the law has been kept today under the new covenant. Amen. Let us always keep that in mind. Amen. Because the new covenant is God's laws in our hearts. It didn't say anything about the new covenant has no laws or it is a lawless covenant. It says that the laws would be placed within our heart. So now under the old covenant, we kept the Sabbath. We had to bring certain breads. We had to bring a drink offering. We had, yes, yes. Um, I, I know I'm running, I'm pressed for time. Please pardon the technical difficulty. It's purely on my end, but as best as I can do, I'm trying to get it forward. Um, the shadow, Hebrews 10 verses 1 clearly shows us that the shadow of the law of the things to come was speaking concerning the sacrifices. It was not speaking of the actual date. Amen. So again, my brother needs to address the historical evidence that I have put forward, that the church kept the Sabbath all the way until 450 AD. All right. Now, if he's saying that after the death and resurrection of Christ, the Sabbath and the laws and these things was removed. How did he um, explain that the church kept keeping the Sabbath all the way until um, 450 AD? He has to address that um, so that we can understand. History shows us what the church have done. Again, as I said earlier, we can debate all day 
on what this scripture means, what this scripture is saying. We can go, but, but history shows us what the church actually did. And the church actually observed the Torah all the way until 450 um, AD. We have that historical record um, that um, of Zosimen that um, anyone can Google and look up so that they can have that clear understanding. Um, let me hand the time back over to my brother. I know I'm pressed for time. And again, please pardon the technical difficulty. It's purely on my end, but I will try my best to make sure that I can put these things forward to you. Yes, I'm going to um, put yeah, you, you have two minutes, Ed, if you want to continue for two more minutes. I, I'll put that time over. I'll put that time over okay. to my brother. I'm waiting for that's, you, brother. That's good. OJ, you have the floor for t up to 10 minutes. Okay, uh, just, give me, uh, just give me one moment. Let me... Okay, so uh, there are many things he's raised. Uh, so let's go to the Sozomon. I don't know who he quoted, the church father. I mean, quoting a church father is not scriptures. We're looking at scriptures. Um, Ed has not shown from the New Testament, from scriptures, any apostle um, or author of the scriptures who compelled or have said that New Testament believers have to observe the Torah. And unfortunately, he did not address what happened, in, what my, my reference to Acts chapter 15. I expected him to address it. If indeed um, the, 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 the God expected the Gentiles to observe Torah as per Torah in the Old Testament, why did the church come together, the apostles, spirit filled, they all agreed that no greater burden should be put on the Gentiles apart from those four laws. He's not addressed it. He, he needs to address that. He needs to address that because that, that, that is the crux of the matter. Acts chapter 15 is the killer. It settles the matter. No further greater burden should be put on you apart from these. Then, but Ed, Ed says, no, 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 no. Somehow they have, have to do more. He needs to address that. There's no record whatsoever we have where they said, oh, but later, we're just introducing you to these ones by these four laws. But don't worry, later, you have to now fulfill the rest of them. So Ed needs to address these practical things. We don't look uh, up to um, Ignatius and all that. We look to the scriptures because I can quote many church fathers who said different things that you would disagree with. We are looking at things from the scriptures here. Um, okay, now you now said Torah is God's law and the law of Jesus. But you see, it makes no sense for us to be debate, debating what Jesus said. I never said the things that came from Jesus are not considered uh, part of the Torah. Jesus might have referenced the Torah, but we are talking about what constitutes law in the context of the new covenant. What constitu constitutes Torah in the context of the new covenant. So, for example, uh, if America had a, a constitution in the 15th century, of course, that constitution becomes null and void once they have a new constitution today. They are not going to be re referencing the constitution in the 5th century to say we are under that constitution. They will be referencing the, the constitution they have now. Now, is it possible that some laws or some things that were in the, the uh, 15th century constitution may be in their present constitution? Yes, it is possible. But the basis for which they fulfill that is not based on what is in the 15th century. That is the point Ed needs to get. He, they, they, what they look at is the current constitution they have, regardless of whether there are some things in the current constitution that are, that are still um, in the um, old constitution. Now, there he made reference to this point where it says, do we make uh, void the, the law? But but it says, rather, we establish that. But before I go to that, let, let's, let me go to the, the, the uh, rich man, the one he talked about that I said I did not address. Now, anybody who reads the New Covenant knows that that was a transitional phase. So there were certain things Jesus dealt with the Jews based on their law, and he was also dealing with everybody generally. It is very clear. For example, when Jesus said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you pay tithes of mint and all, and you've forgotten the weightier matters of the law. This you should do, but not forget the weightier matters of the law. Of course, he was addressing the Jews because they had the law. He wasn't addressing the Gentiles. So, of course, when the rich man came, he was addressing them based on the law. He was telling them what to do based on the law. He wasn't saying that the Gentiles, who he sent Paul, to instruct about the new covenant to follow after that. After all, I, I also want to ask uh, Ed whether he sold all that he ha has and he's uh, giving, <laughs> giving to the poor since he says what Christ said that constitutes the Torah. So basically what we find out that from, from what was going on there is that Christ was addressing the Jews based on their law. He wasn't uh, addressing the Gentiles. 
after all, he said what he was sent to the lost ship of Israel. So what do you expect him to, to do? He would address, he will, of course, reference the law. But when Christ died and the veil was torn, we see the New Testament. Okay, sorry, I think I lost him and he's calling back. Can you hear me? Please take into uh, Josiah, please take into consideration my time because of that as well. Uh, so sorry, guys, we have to use this means because um, for some reason, Ed could not connect, connect her through Restream. So um, no problem. You have six minutes. OK, yeah. So uh, where was I? Um, OK, so Christ was dealing with him based on the law. He wasn't instructing the Gentiles, but Ed should tell us where the apostles, James, John, Peter, Paul, any one of them taught apart from those four commandments that they had been given. Ed is not able to show, he's going to history because he can't go to the scriptures. He, he should show us where the apostles or authors of the scriptures taught that new covenant believers should observe the Torah. He can show that, okay? So um, I wanted to address that. Then, now, what Ed, I would like Ed to explain to us what's the difference between the law of Moses, the law of the Torah, and the law of Messiah. Apparently, Ed doesn't, to me, it appears that Ed doesn't seem to make a distinction between that. Um, he quotes Romans 2, 31, which says, Do we then nullify the law through faith? Far from it. On the contrary, we establish it. So when Ed reads that in his mind, he feels that Paul is saying, you see, we establish the law, Torah by observing the days, the new moon, circumcision, and all that. By the way, I, I, I would like to, during the cross-examination, I would like to ask him about circumcision as well, since we should establish the Torah, if we are still bound to, 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 to fulfill that. But what was Paul saying here? Because Ed is not making a distinction between the law of Moses and the law of Messiah. He doesn't, he doesn't understand, in my understanding, that Paul is referring to establishing the essence of the law through fulfilling the law of Christ. How do we know this? Okay. If we go back to um, um, oh, there's a particular verse I was going to. Okay, uh, I'm just going to read this from um, Romans two, uh, fourteen. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law instinct instinctively perform the requirements of the law, Ed, Ed has to meaningfully explain this. If the Gentiles don't have the Torah, how? In what sense do they fulfill the requirements of the law? So this is what Paul is saying that we establish. Now that we go back to begin to observe the rituals of the Torah. He says, wait, he says what? Though not having the law are a law to themselves. All right? That, that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience testify and their thoughts alternatively accusing them or defending them on the day when, when my... Um, According to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of, 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 of the heart. He, he went on to say what? Where then is boasting? It, is, it, is, it has been excluded by what kind of, of law? This is, where Ed, this is where, what Ed needs to take into consideration. By what kind of law? Of works? No. So Ed is conflating the whole thing here. He's thinking that Paul is talking about the law of works of the Torah. So Paul, so when Paul is saying in verse 31 that we go to establish the law, Paul is making a distinction now between the law of Torah works and the law of Messiah. He says, no, Paul is clearly telling us here that it is not the law of works, but the law of faith. So this is the law Paul is saying that we go to establish, not the law of works. I would like Ed to explain to us what the distinction is here then in his, in his own understanding, the, the difference between the law of works and the law of faith. He said, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This makes no sense from the, from the argument Ed, Ed is making. It makes no sense whatsoever. How is a person justified apart from the works of the law? So he said so many things. Um, uh, uh, sorry, my, my audio is not... Um, okay, so I'm just trying to get my audio. I'm here getting some kind of scrambling sound. Uh, Josiah, please, could you pause my time? I can't, I can't hear myself. Sure, two more so minutes. I'm trying to refresh my mixer. I can't. Uh, okay, I think it's better now. Sorry about that. For some reason, I was hearing... This is a muffling sound. Okay, so I'm back. So, um, so this is exactly what Paul was talking about when he says we establish the law, not the, the, the not the law of the Torah, <laughs> but the law of Christ. There's a law of the Messiah. All right. So in Colossians 2:16, he also said the Sabbath wasn't included. I don't know what, what he said about that, but it's very clear that it says that we should not be judged 
in meat or drink or in uh, or according to the Sabbath. Says these were a shadow of things to come. All right. So it's not just enough to show that the early Christians observed the Sabbath. Yeah, they did that because just like the early church, but it wasn't because it was law to them. The Jews and Gentiles met not because it was law to them. Okay. So um, we also see that Paul made a very, very profound statement where he said, I am not, I am not under the law. Why would Paul make a statement like that when he says he becomes all things to all men? All right. So I want to read this because this is what really refutes what what. I mean, Eddie's Eddie's, Eddie's argument here. For though I am free to all people, I'm reading Romans 9, 19. For though I am free from all people, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may gain more to the Jews. To the Jews, I become as a Jew. How does that make any sense in the light of of, uh, of, um, Ed's argument? How do you become become a Jew when he's already a Jew? So that I may gain the Jews. To those who are under the law, I become as one under the law. Though not being under the law myself. Oh! This is so crystal clear. How how does he explain this? Paul says he's not under the law, but 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 according to um, Ed, we are under the law. We have to fulfill it. He said, "I became as one under the law, though not being under the law, so that I might gain those who are under the law." To those who are without the law, I became as without the law, though not being without the law. Now, what law is he talking about? Though not being though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. Okay. Okay, so, that's time. Yeah. So I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay. So next we'll move on to the second rebuttal, which is five minutes each. Whenever Ed's ready, I'll start the time. Yeah, I don't know. Ed just keeps cutting off. It's such a terrible way to just engage this de- debate. I, I wish he had a computer or something, but Ed, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Are you there? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes, yeah. we can hear. yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Uh, five minute rebuttal whenever you're ready, Ed. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks once again. And again, please allow me to apologize for the technical difficulty. It is purely on my end. Uh, but I'm still able, uh, as long as the brothers are still able to hear me. Uh, we can still accomplish what we have to accomplish. Now, he quote Acts 15, the first Jerusalem council, as if this council um, is talking about doing away with the law. This council is speaking uh, concerning circumcision. All right, I'm going to go Acts 15, verses 1, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised, after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Amen. This was the argument. This was the dispute. Um, can, must they be circumcised? Amen. The argument was not should they keep Sabbath? Should they keep high holy days? Because those things was not in question. The only thing in question here is should they be circumcised? Amen. And who is he speaking to? He's speaking to the church. Amen. He's addressing the church. And if the brother um, believes and holds that the church was made up of Jews, Israelites, um, and Gentiles, all right, he is speaking to the church. Amen. So now what um, what instructions was given um, in Acts 15? What instructions was given? Um, let's let's um, skip down here because I'm going to really need to utilize my time here. Um Let's go down to verses um, 28. For it seems good unto the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than than these necessity. Now keep in mind, the question is, should they circumcise? The question is not, should they keep Sabbath? That is not the question, because the Sabbath is not in question. All right. So he is saying, no, you don't have to be circumcised physically. Amen. But listen to what he says here. It seems good um, to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on the but these uh, things. All right. That ye abstain from meats offered to idols. Now, wait a minute. Where in the New Testament do we see? What's an, uh, a, a meat offered to idol or an idol meat, unclean meat? 
Where can we go in the New Testament to find that? We cannot. We have to go into the law, Leviticus the 11th chapter, to find out what's clean and unclean meat. They go forward, all right, or blood. Wait a minute. Where in the New Testament do we see that we cannot drink blood? It is not in the New Testament. They are pointing to the Torah that says you cannot eat or drink blood. All right. So we can't use Acts 15 as if, oh, Acts 15 is, is, is against Torah, is anti-Torah. No, Acts 15 points back to Torah. It points back to Torah. And he is telling them, you can't eat unclean meat. You can't use blood. Stay away from fornication. These are pillars that has been laid in the Torah. This is what he is pointing to when he says, oh, that, that's for the Jews. No, he's speaking here to the church, Jews and Gentiles that are a part of the church. Amen. Everything that is addressed in scripture is addressed to the church. So we can't say this is just speaking to the This is speaking to both Jews and Gentiles. The scripture is clear. All right. You can't drink blood. Where do we find that? Torah. You can't eat um, strangled meat. Meat that died for self. Where do we find that? Torah. All right. Fornication. Torah. They told them clearly these are necessary things that you have to because at that point in time, these things was raging. Amen. So they made sure they highlighted these things. But please keep in mind, the question here was circumcision. How much how many more time do I have? One minute. I have one minute. One minute. Amen. Uh, right over here. Um, Acts 17. Amen. Acts 17. Um, we see something much stronger about, about the Sabbath. All right. Um, Acts 17. Let's look at verses. Let's look at verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, what does it mean his manner? I think we lost him again. Manner was. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, we can hear you now. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. And Paul, as his manner was, went into the synagogue, all right, and reasoned with them on the Sabbath day. Paul kept the Sabbath. Paul kept the Sabbath. It was his manner, way of life. This was what he did. And keep in mind, this is after the death and resurrection of Christ. Paul is still keeping the Sabbath. This is after Paul was met on the road of the, to Damascus. Paul is still keeping the Sabbath. So when we put scriptures with history, we see nowhere, absolutely nowhere, where it is said, listen, don't keep Sabbath. All right, we see the apostles still keep the Sabbath. All right, we see them um, speaking to the um church in Acts 15, pointing back to the Torah, not giving any new laws, like my brother said, some, some new laws. He still have to show these new laws. Where are these new laws that Christ gave? Where are they? Everything that Christ gave points to Torah, points to Torah. When Christ says, you have heard it before, when you're speaking concerning um, murder, but I say unto you, any man that is angry with his brother have already committed murder, what is Christ doing? Christ is giving a greater understanding to the law. It just doesn't start when you pull the gun and shoot your brother. Ain't your brother in your in your heart? You are going against Torah automatically. Christ is showing a greater understanding or the proper understanding of Torah. He's not saying you have heard it said before, "Thou shalt not kill." But I say you may kill. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he is saying. He's not saying you have heard it said before. Um, don't commit adultery. But I'm saying to you, please commit adultery. That's not what he is saying. He said, if you even look at a woman and lust after her in your heart, you're committing adultery. Christ is giving us the proper understanding of Torah and the proper way to acknowledge Torah. All right. My brother needs to address this. All right. He's given me a whole list of things to address. He had not addressed what Christ said. He had not addressed it. Oh, he did address address the history. He says he don't he don't care about it. That's, that's fine. All right. But again, I am showing in scripture with Acts 15 that he gave it points to Torah. It points okay. to the Torah. It does not say here, oh, we don't have to keep no Torah. Do as you please. Eat what you want. Drink what you want. Blood and anything else. It didn't say that. It did not say that. Um, is that my time? Yeah, that's time. Yeah, that's time. 
Thanks, Ed. That's my time. Okay. OJ, OJ your five-minute five rebuttal minutes. whenever you're ready. Okay. So I think there's something that um, Ed is not really addressing. You see, whether the issue was circumcision is irrelevant. I think it's a way to evade the, the substance of the point. The issue is that there were some Judaizers or hybrid, hybrid Christians that were bringing something of the law that was a necessity of the law, in the law, circumcision. He can't run away from that. Even if it wasn't, even if the issue wasn't the Sabbath, circumcision was as was equally as weighty. Literal circumcision was as weighty. And they looked up to, and, and they could have easily brought any other thing from the law. And the issue is, why in the resol resolution of this issue did they say no greater burden should be put upon them Apart from this, why did they, why did they not even mention the Sabbath? Is it not even funny that of the four laws, of the four things they said, they didn't say, "Oh, that you observe the Sabbath." They did not. So the, I think that it's a moot point to evade the, 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 the point that look, the Gentiles who walk by the law, the Spirit of Christ, are not under the Mosaic law. That is why Paul, Barnabas, uh, uh, Paul, uh, James. Peter, the rest of the apostles, they were in agreement that no greater burden should be put upon them. Now, whether they were referencing the Torah or not regarding these four laws, it's inconsequential. Ed is not able to show us that beyond these four laws, that the Gentiles were required to observe feasts, do other things. And he keeps saying, and where did Christ come with something new? I'm like, was Ed not listening to what I was saying? Ed should tell us where in the, in the, in the Old Testament, <laughs> they were told to love their enemies. It doesn't make sense for Christ to say something like, um, um, we read that where he says in Matthew um, 5, 43, you have heard it was said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemies, right? He said there was no change. Where's this new thing? Where's this new thing he says? But Christ is saying, but I say to you, love your enemies. So is that not, is that not a complete contradiction? It was said, it was said ask Ed, 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 please tell us, where was it said, hate your enemies? What, where was Christ quoting? So he said he didn't bring any new thing. So if it was said, hate your enemies, you need to be able to, able to explain if love your enemies and hate your enemies, you know, mean the same thing. They definitely don't mean the same thing. All right. So the, the reason why I want to still zero down on this Acts chapter 15 is because that is the crux of the matter. All right. The council met, the church met. This was a time for them to let us know that, oh, well, they don't need to observe circumcision, but they need to observe the rest of the law. They said, no, 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 no. If you even read the whole thing, I'm surprised that he didn't even, I, I, I didn't really have time to really go through. If you look looked at the argument from, from those verses, and they were asking them, why are you testing the spirit of God? All right, why are you testing the spirit of God? That we are saved by grace the same way they are. All these things were, were there. And when they came together, they determined that, no further burden should be put on the Gentiles apart from this. And then I think he also makes a strong argument in thinking that, um, in saying that, well, if we say we are not under Torah, that means we can kill, murder, rape women. Oh, that's absurd if you think about it. Why were we given the spirit? The Bible says, well, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. It says, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. What does that mean to Ed? How does Ed explain all these things? Because if you're led by the Spirit, you will fulfill the essence of the law. So when he says, because we say we're not under the law, we could kill, we could commit murder. No, I, I think that's not a very good grasp of what the new covenant came to bring. Because... We... Sorry, my time. Pause my time. I lost him again. This is really yeah, frustrating. You... This is so frustrating. You have two minutes remaining. Okay. Can you hear me, Ed? Yes, I can. Yeah, sorry, I don't know. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll go on. Yeah, so, okay, so let me start my two minutes. So, um, where was I? So, um, very, very clearly, Paul makes all these things so clear. How Peter ate with the Gentiles, how they were considered unclean, but God showed him. So, it, it the, the changes were, are clearly shown in the scriptures. But So, in fact, during the cross-examination, I have some interesting uh, questions for, for Ed. Ed needs to really address that aspect that has to do with the Gentiles not giving any greater burden apart from those four uh, commandments, whether they were gotten from the law or Torah, it's irrelevant. Ed also did not uh, need to address how love your enemies 
is the same thing as, as hate your enemies. He says Christ did not bring anything new. He's still waiting for me to show the new thing Christ brought. That's a, that's clear. That's new. Okay. So um, we also see in, in Paul's writings very clearly that. Sorry. In Paul's writing, he said, I am not under the law. What does that mean? Ed did not, Ed did not address that. When Paul said to the Jews, I become like the Jew. How does that make any sense if he's already a Jew? That's to show that Paul was the new man. There's neither Jew nor Greek in Christ. Paul, yes, he went to the Sabbath because that's the Jews and the Gentiles met, but not because it was a, the, the Gentiles were obliged. It was a law to them. So yes, he fulfilled the customs. But, but Ed is not able to show that Paul did that because he was bound by the Sabbath. The same Paul said, no one should judge you in terms of the Sabbath days. These were shadows of things to come. Christ is our Sabbath. He is the fulfillment of the law. Our rest is in Christ, not in the rituals of the law. He made it very, very clear. Hebrews chapter, uh, finally, Hebrews chapter 9 clearly tells us that there is a disannulling. Hebrews, uh, sorry, Hebrews 7. He says, for on one hand, there's a disannulling of the commandment that went before because it was weak. Clearly shows us that this has been annulled for a new commandment in Christ. So I don't really know. I think um, Ed will need to address um, these things. Maybe in the cross-examination, we might have some free flow discussion. I think I would end at that for now. Okay, that includes the opening, the two um, rebuttal, um, first and second rebuttals. Now we'll go on, move on to the cross-examination, which should be pretty lively. Uh, to start out, we'll give 10 minutes to Ed to examine OJ and to ask OJ questions. Ed, whenever you're ready to start. Yes, yes. I want to start at Acts 15. Amen. I would like to start at Acts 15. Um, OJ, the four instructions that was given to the church, um, were they in the Torah? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So the apostles was pointing to the Torah. All right. They didn't say, listen, we have some new stuff for you. They was pointing to the Torah. They wasn't in the New Testament anywhere. It was pointing to the Torah. You said it's irrelevant. It may be irrelevant to you, but they were pointing to the Torah and they were speaking concerning circumcision. Paul went deeper concerning circumcision on 1 Corinthians 7. Verses 18 and 19, Paul said, Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Listen carefully to Paul's word now at verse 19. Listen, circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. Listen, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Why is Paul... After the death and resurrection of Christ, after he was introduced to Christ on the road of the Damascus, speaking about the keeping of the commandments of God. Why? When my brother is, is, is alluding that, it is done away with. It is removed. It is gone. Is that a question? Is it, it is a question time, just to let you know. Is, is that a yeah, question? I, I understand. It's a question time. It's my time. I'm, I'm just trying to okay. put it forward. You've already answered one question there. All right. Now, when the young man asks Christ, um, what must I do to keep the um, to keep um, to enter into life? Uh, what Christ gave to him, was it from the Torah? Yes, it was from the Torah. But you need to also Thank tell you. us where he, where from the Torah you were required to oh, sell oh, all things. Hold on. It's, it's, yeah. it's my question time. You okay. can rebuttal in your time. Okay. So twice we see the apostles after Christ and Christ pointing back to the Torah. He said something about something is new about, you know, love your enemies. The Torah teaches us that if you find your enemy's ox in the street, return it to your enemy. This is what the Torah teaches us. It tells us that we must be the bigger person. Amen. It teaches us this. So when Christ says, listen, love your enemies. All right. He's not going against something Torah said. He's not fighting against something Torah said. So I just wanted to address that. Again, um, I just read there in Acts 17. It says that this was Paul's manner to keep the Sabbath. All right. Could you please briefly explain to us what does it mean it was his manner? 
could you read? Uh, could you read exactly the 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 the, um, the verse, if okay. possible? You want to re read the, the verse again? Let me go back. Yes. Here. What what um? Oh, just I can bring it up. What um? Okay. What what particular um, verse is that? Seventeen. Verse? Yes. Act Seventeen, on um, verses two and four. As his manner was, mm -hmm. went in unto them, and three Sabbaths days reason with them out of the scriptures what does it mean it was paul's manner okay so i mean if you read about this uh, the 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 point here is not to say that it was paul's manner to observe the sabbath that's not the point it was his manner to go into please, on please address, please address the question what, what, what I, does it I, mean I, it was if you manner. would allow me answer the question i'm, I'm about to answer it, but you're not allowing I'm, I'm pressed for time i'm pressed for yeah time. I'm, I'm saying it was his manner to go into the, the, it was to, to, to go into uh, the, the, the temple or where they gathered on the Sabbath to reason with them. It's not saying that it was he was obliged or he was bound to keep the Sabbath. It's just saying that it was something he regularly did. So I don't really see the point. It's a moot point. No, but if it was his manner, way of life, how could that be new? Paul could have met with them in the marketplaces. He could have went to their homes. He be could have met them anyway. Because the Jews met on the so, Sabbath so, day. So again, oh, oh, hold on. So again, you, you've given your answer. Um, this is really for the audience that's listening. They can hear your answer and hear how you re reply to the questions that, that I am showing you. I've already clearly shown Christ pointed back to Torah. I've already shown Acts 15, the apostles pointed back to Torah. I showed you after the death and resurrection of Christ, Paul's manner, way of life, his custom. This wasn't just something he did because he, he wanted to go meet people. Paul met people every day up and down the street. Paul traveled from city to city every day meeting people. So this was not just something he did just traveling around. Paul was his manner, his way of life to keep the Sabbath. He was brought up as a Jew. So, of course, Sabbath observance was a part of him. So now, after he met Christ, all right, it was still his manner and way of life um, to keep the Sabbath. Um, final question. I know I, I had um, um, three minutes there. Um, let, let me put the, the, the final question here um, to my brother. Um, Luke 4, in the book of Luke 4, all right, Luke 4, we're going to look at verses 16 real quick. And then hand it back over to you. All right. Hand it over to you. Luke 4. And he came to Nazareth, speaking here of Christ, where he had been brought up. And as his customs was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Was it Christ's custom, way of life to keep the Sabbath? Yes, he was a Jew. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. And if you follow Christ, do you keep the Sabbath? Yes, by entering his rest. Okay, good. You do keep the Sabbath. Thank you for saying that. By entering that. his How rest. How much time do I have? I know you said five minutes. Three and a half minutes Three. remaining. Three and a half minutes remaining. All right. Clearly, um, I have shown to my brother that... um. In, in the scripture that you quoted, you, you quoted a scripture earlier that said, um, um, sorry, I think we lost him. Let's give him some time. It's just connection problems. He's not cut off. Uh, so he, I think he'll come back this time. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, yes, yes. Once again, I have to keep asking pardon. I know it, it's kind of frustrating for OJ. I know it's frustrating for the audience, but, you know, it is clearly on my end that um, we're having this technical difficulty. Yeah, so you, you could go on. Go on, yeah. No problem. Uh, <clears throat> lost him again. Uh I can hear you now, yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Acts, uh, um, Galatians 3. Galatians 3, um, 
I want to read verses 19. Um, um, Wherefore serveth the law? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Um, what law was added because of transgression? That's the laws of Moses in my understanding. Oh, that's all the laws. What, what, what was it added to? What do you mean added? I don't understand yes, what you mean. It by says there was a law that was added. But if you're saying that's all of the laws, what was all of the laws added to? I, the way I, the way I understand that, I don't think we're just trying to say that it was added to something. It just says that it came about. The law came about for trans, you know, for as as the Bible says, to expose the sinful nature of man. Not because it was added, not because there was something, and then laws were added. I don't really understand it the way you're in, okay. you're reading that. Okay, okay. Let, 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 let me look at it from your end. Okay. All of the laws that was given to Moses was 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 brought forward until Christ came. Yes. When Christ came, all of the law of Moses was removed. That's how you're interpreting the scripture? But yes, if you allow me to interpret it in context. And I explain that. Wait, if wait, wait, no, uh, wait. I, I, I'm just, I just need your answer now. When, when, you, when it's your turn, you can explain it and, and, and go down. So yes. what you're saying, this scripture is saying, all the laws that was given to Moses was brought forth for a reason until Christ came. Yes. And then when Christ came now, all the laws that was given for Moses was removed and we and we're no longer under them. That's what you're saying. We are no longer under that law. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yes, all the laws that was given to Moses. Thou shall not kill, adultery, all of these laws that was given to Moses, we are no longer under them since Christ came. That's how you're reading the scripture. Perfectly correct. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, yes. so all of the laws have been removed and we are no longer under any laws that was given to Moses. So I don't know why Christ pointed back to the laws that when, when the young man asked him. I don't know why at the Jerusalem Council, the apostles pointed back to the laws um, when, when given the instructions to the church. I don't know why they pointed back to them if as according to you, all of these laws have been removed and we are no longer under them. I, I strongly disagree with that and i'm going to yield the rest of my time over to you i think i have like a minute and change left yeah one minute yes yes i'm going to yield the time over to um yeah. okay thank you ed oj whenever you're ready 10 minutes for okay, yes. yeah just give me one moment <clears throat> okay i would like to start here yes. okay um, so, so since you believe that New Testament believers are required to keep the Torah, like the laws, to be saved, not just what Jesus said, but including the feast and all that, could you clearly explain um, if this involves the 613 commandments, which, which of them, and on what basis you have arrived at this, real quick, real quickly, of time. I'm, so, I'm sorry, you, you said... How which of them? There are six hundred and thirteen because you said we should keep the Torah. There, which so how many? How many of these are we supposed to keep to be saved? How many we, of them? We, we, are to, we, we are to keep the laws, Amen. With the understanding given to Christ, we understand that the sacrificial laws have been removed because Christ is that perfect sacrifice. But we are to keep the laws. The Ten Commandments started there. We are to keep each and every last one of them. All right. Love thy neighbor. That's not a part of the Ten Commandments. A man should not sleep with a man. That's a, that's not a part of the Ten Commandments that we still have oh, to keep. The wait, wait, okay, oh, okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. It's okay, it's okay. What about the uh, what about uh, this? What about circumcision? We circumcise today the heart. No, 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 no. But oh, well, okay. So you uh, you agree that there's a physical aspect of the law that has. That was a that was a type that has its true implications, right? In the New Testament, I, 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 yeah, I showed in the New Testament that Paul, speaking of of physical circumcision, showed clearly that there's no longer a need because physical circumcision um, was a sign, amen, of the law. It was a token of the covenant. No, no, but, but you see, no, 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 but, but you I see, oh, hold on, hold on, faith. hold on. It was clearly stated that. This was supposed to be a covenant, and anyone who was who wasn't circumcised would be cut off from God's people. In fact, it was 
such an important aspect of the law. So despite the fact that they had the circumcision of the heart, it was still required of God's people to still perform the physical uh, circumcision. Do you agree? I agree it was. And at Acts 15, the apostle said under the divine spirit of God that they are no longer under the physical circumcision. Beautiful. They no longer have to be circumcised according to um, the manner of Moses, but our hearts still must be circumcised. That's fine. So in that same case, why can't you also see in that same light the, 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 the point in the argument that just like the Sabbath, can you hear me? Josiah, uh, you might have to pause my time. I've lost him again. Can you hear me? Uh, this is really so terrible. <laughs> this debate, one of the <laughs> terrible way to have a debate. Yeah. But well, I think I guess it's better than nothing. I've lost. It. Can you hear me? Well, made it. We made it most of the way through. We can just get through this last. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, seven minutes time. remaining, OJ. I lost my thought when I was asking him a question. Let me see. Okay. Um, okay. So in the same vein, you have been able to understand that it's the circumcision of the heart. So that's what we are also trying to say, that the feasts... The Passover, Christ is now Passover. The first fruits, Christ is the first fruit from the dead. The Sabbath, which was observed, was a type, a shadow. And that is why our Sabbath is coming to the rest in Christ. We're also saying this thing. So why can't you also have that understanding that these shadows are also fulfilled in Christ? Why do you think circumcision is exceptional? And you think you could excuse circumcision and not the Sabbath? By what criteria do you have two, two rules? Two, two rules there. Yeah, well, I, I see the apostle still physically keeping Sabbath, all right? I see it as still Paul's manner to keep Sabbath. I can see if you were saying it's, it's uh, a spiritual something. Now that we enter into Christ, we no longer have to keep it. The apostles would have been examples of this, but the apostles still kept the Sabbath. No, but the, yeah, but but we we understand that the Jews, of course, they were they had the right to continue in their customs, and they were given the law. But the issue here is about the Gentiles, all right? So. The issue is, can you okay? Can you show us anywhere in the New Testament where the apostles or the author of the New Test, any of the authors of the New Testament, told uh, uh, believers, New Testament believers, Gentiles, to observe the Sabbath? Explicit, clear scriptures. Yes. Do you have anywhere? Yes, I can show you multiple places. I'll go to Hebrews four. Yeah. I'll go to Hebrews four, where Paul definitely um, commands the church to still keep the Sabbath. Let me um, you, let me read let me, that there for you, and then my you can address um, my time. Four. Yeah? Um, do you want me to read it, or you, do, or you just want me to give no, it? You can read it, read it, read it real quick. I need thank, to know. Thank you. I'll read it real quick. Hebrews 4, I'll start at verse 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his work. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, today after so long a time, as it is said today, if ye will hear my voice, harden not your heart. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day. Therefore remain a, a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also must cease from his own work as God did from his. So here we have a clear yeah, 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 yeah. from Paul. You, 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 that's really like a waste long read and has nothing, nothing whatsoever saying anything about Gentiles having to ob ob observe the Sabbath. You just quoted something very long 
and there's nothing about Gentiles observing Sabbath. Anyway, I have to go on because my time is limited. So explain what Paul meant by this when he said, um, look, Paul, uh, I, Paul, tell you, that's reading Galatians 5, if you yourself, uh, yourself are circumcised, Christ will, will benefit you not in I testify. If you have been um, circumcised, you have to keep the whole law. Um, you have been severed from Christ. Why is that? And why is that not also applicable to other laws like the Sabbath that a person says you must keep to be justified before God? Because Paul is clearly showing that the as as was ordered at the Jerusalem Council, that physical circumcision is no longer required. The Jerusalem Council spoke on it. They um, put it forward. So now the church must follow it. And Acts 15, as well as Hebrew 4, is written to the church. It's not just written to a particular part or piece of the church, but to the entire church. Okay. So, all right. So, um Paul also says, so what does Paul mean? What does Paul mean when he says, now the righteousness of God apart from the law? In Romans 3.21, when he says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. But it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for those who believe. What does he mean when he says the, right, the, the, um, the righteousness apart from the law? What does that mean? Is speaking concerning the law of, of um, sacrifices, all right, that we are no longer under that law and uh, with that we can seek righteousness um, without fulfilling that law physically. We don't have to bring a lamb, a goat, or anything, but through righteousness, sincerity of the heart, we can approach Christ to seek forgiveness. For okay, I, okay, I, I'll have to cut you short. And, uh, I have to disagree right there, um, just from my, my sound, because Paul did not say anything about sacrifice. I think you're, you're injecting your own reading into that. It says, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. It says nothing about sacrifice. I want to, want to note that, but I want to go on because my time, I have very limited time. I have so many questions. Um, so what did Paul mean when he says to the Jew, I became a Jew? Since he's already a Jew, why is he saying to the Jew, I became a Jew? How does that make any sense? And why does he say, he also said, um, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read that term. For though I am free, okay, I have become, I have, I, I have made myself a slave to all. To the Jew, I become a Jew that I may gain the Jews. To those who are under the law, who are under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being under the law myself. All right? So you need to explain this. So how does, how is Paul saying that as he became a Jew to the Jews and him being under the law, even though he's not under the law? How does that make any sense in light of your claims? Well, Christ made it known clearly that the Jews of his days were not keeping the law. Um, when we read Matthew 23, he called them hypocrites. He said they say and they do not. All right. They were white in sepulcher that appear to be righteous outside, but within their hearts, all right, was full of dead man bones. So Paul is saying, all right, sometimes I, when I'm speaking to the Jews, I become as the Jew so that I can gain them. My knowledge that I yeah, have. Yeah, but Paul said, but Paul, wait, wait, wait. Bring them there. Okay, fine. Let Paul me, said, on, let me finish. I'm, not, okay, go ahead, I'm go concerned ahead, about the part I'm where he says, he, where he says he's not under the law. Can you explain that? What does that mean? Again, Paul is speaking not about all the law, but a particular law. I showed that in Galatians 3. He is speaking concerning the law that was added. If you don't agree, that's fine. But this is my stance. He is speaking concerning a particular law and not all the law. Okay. How many minutes do I have, um, Josiah? Three minutes. Okay. Okay. I still have three minutes. Okay. You see, the problem I see there is that you just subjectively choose. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Ed? Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear I me? I can hear you now. I can't oh, hear you okay, now. you couldn't hear. I can hear you now. Now, so you see what is going on here is that we cannot now have a rational, objective discussion because you subjectively choose what Paul is talking about when he talks about the law and says, well, he was speaking about just circumcision here or speaking about the sacrifice, but but it doesn't say so. Then in, in that case, why can I not why can I not also use that same kind of argument to just discount anything you say and just subjectively choose what I want it to be at the time? Because when Paul says I'm not under the law, he doesn't say it's sacrifice. He doesn't say it's about this. He says under the law. 
So, so uh, again, again, OJ, um, you I'm showing you where I stand in scripture. You're showing me where you stand in scripture. I showed you in Galatian, Paul was addressing the law that was added for transgression. You say that's all the laws. That's fine. I don't agree. He was speaking about a particular law, the law of, um, sacrifices and that is clear of that's what we talking you already agreed he's not talking about murder adultery and these other things so these laws still stand and the laws that were shown so it's not as though we can't have a conversation we're having one i'm just showing you where i disagree okay which i have the right to and you that, show me where you disagree that's fine so let me ask you a question because you were saying nothing changed so where did where did where did christ get the quote where he quoted it was said hit love your um I hate your enemies. Where did he quote that from? Was that from the Torah? No, that was from Second Temple um, Talmud. That's where he quoted that from. But again, Christ was basically showing them and giving them a proper understanding, showing them in the Torah that you can love your enemies, um, speaking first of your neighbors, um, and he went deeply into that. This is not the only thing that Christ was speaking on. He spoke on adultery, he spoke on murder, and he gave them the proper understanding to these things. So you said he was quoting from the Talmud. Anyway, let's leave that. But it's evident that love your enemy and hate your enemies are different because you kept, kept on asking me what's the new thing. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Where did where 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 did Christ? Where do you see that it says if they slap you on one cheek, turn the other cheek in the Torah? If this is not a change, it says it was stated an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, if one stops you on the other cheek, turn the other cheek. If that's not a new thing, can you show us where Christ said this, where this Christ got slap you on the other cheek from the Torah? Again, I quoted the scripture already in Torah that said, if you see your enemy's ox, return it to him. It specifically says your enemy. This could be someone you're at war with, someone you're angry with, someone you're at fighting with. If you see their ox in the street, return it to them. You it, must be the bigger person. These things are in the law. All it's right? my it's time up, Josiah. It's okay. Yes. It's my time up. It's my time yes, up. Yes, that, that's time. Okay. Yes. Uh, so this is the second round of cross-examination. Ed has five minutes to follow up with OJ. Whenever you're ready, Ed. Amen. Amen. I just want to address something real quick. You know, my brother keeps saying that, um, you know, I'm picking and choosing. I'm showing parts in the scriptures, the scriptures that I'm given. I'm showing where I stand as my brother is showing where he stands. It's up to the listeners to be able to listen, follow along in the scriptures and be able to see where, where we are at. Amen. So now um, in Romans, let me show that real quickly so I can ask. Uh, my brother, this this question, Romans, the second chapter, uh, Paul speak of true circumcision. Amen. Romans, the second chapter. Let me utilize this quickly. I'm starting verse 25. For circumcision verily profited if thou keepest the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision, and shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the latter and circumcision does transgress the law. So here Paul is speaking concerning true circumcision, which is in the heart. Now, if it was law, which and it was law before, and it was also stated before that the Most High in, in Jeremiah 9, that the Most High would do away with uh, both the circumcised and the uncircumcised because their hearts was not circumcised. All right. So it clearly shows us circumcision. My question to you, though, my brother, as I wanted to uh, put the letter in, in, in Hebrews that I just read that Paul, was that addressed to the church? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Sorry. Yes. I was going to ask you when yes, you read, yes, uh, the, the, it was breaking at the time. So when you said, um, um, Josiah, I don't mind you giving him some the, the, more time. I, I asked you the letter in Hebrews that I read that Paul was writing. Was that addressed to the church? Yes, I believe it was addressed to the, to the church. And is the church made up of Jews and Gentiles? Yes. So how could you say that is not speaking to the Gentiles? 
what part is not speaking to the Gentiles? When did I say? No, I, I when I quoted it to you just now, you said I was wasting my time reading it because it is not addressing the Gentile. I didn't. I, I can't recall saying that. Sorry, maybe we are talking about two different things. Okay, so you agree the letter that Paul was speaking there of keeping the seventh day Sabbath was speaking also to the Gentiles. Oh no, 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 no. There was what I'm saying is we are, we are wasting my time because there was nothing in. In what Paul was saying there that had to do with Gentiles observing the Sabbath. You are the one reading your own eyes into that text. He was explaining why the Jews have been robbed of the Sabbath of God because they did not even be, be, be uh, um, he's, he's not talking, saying anything about the Gentiles observing the Sabbath. So he quoted something very long that had nothing to do with, with the Gentiles observing the Sabbath. He was specifically referring to the Jews. He specifically said, they remain it a day of rest to the people of God. Mm -hmm. And he that have ceased from his work must cease the same way God ceased at the beginning. What did God cease at the beginning? He ceased from his labor, from his works. Okay, so now if Paul is saying the same way God ceased from his works, we have to cease from his work. How could you say that is not telling the church to keep the Sabbath? It's not telling the it's it's not telling the church to keep the Sabbath because I think you don't really understand the essence of the Sabbath, which is to come into the rest of Christ. But yeah, it's not by going to observe a literal day where on the seventh day you do not walk. You see what I'm saying? So yes, it's telling them, but that rest is the same rest we have in Christ, not a rest by observing a literal Sabbath. That's what I'm saying. It says here, he is speaking concerning the seventh day. Mm. He is speaking concerning the seventh day. How can you say he's not speaking of the Sabbath? The, oh, gosh. Of course, it is related to the Sabbath, but I'm saying that these were but, a, brother, a shadow of what was to come. At one point and, and say something else at another point. I'm not let saying... Me, let me, let me I'm not saying two different things. Of course, Paul is, is speaking about the seventh day, but he's talking about the fact that they have been deprived of, of that rest because of their unbelief. So it's not saying that the Gentiles should observe the Sabbath. My question was to show you where it says the Gentiles were required to observe the Sabbath. And you haven't been able to show, show us that. Sorry, my, my throat is... Um... <clears throat> okay, that's time. OJ, you have five minutes for cross-examination. Okay, so uh, you could start now. I want I want to take off from the last question I asked you because I wasn't I didn't get a satisfactory answer. You said, when I said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but now it says if someone um, slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. I'm saying where the, oh, you're saying that Christ says if you see your, your neighbors or your enemies, whatever, fall into a pit, you pick it up. But that's not what we, I'm addressing. All right. It was for what I'm specifically addressing was an eye for an eye. In other words, if someone slaps you, if someone cuts off your hand, chop off the person's hand too. It, the law required that if there was a pregnant woman and there was a fight, if she lost her eye, you should also pluck out the eye of the person. So, and this is what Christ was referring to when he says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But he now says, now, if someone slaps you on one cheek, cheek turn the other cheek. Can you point us to the, the, the point where, um, um, if that's not a change, can you point us to the place of the Torah where uh, that was given that if one slaps you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek? I was asking you, can you point us to where in the Torah Christ got the, the teaching from, if one slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek? Because you said there wasn't any new thing. He was just, you know, bringing up the way it's a new thing. You kept on asking. I'm not asking about helping your enemy bring out his, his cattle or whatever that falls into a pit. This is a specific, this is a specific thing that deals with an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And Jesus is saying, if one hits you, slaps you on one, turn the other cheek. Where in the Torah the, would you find that? Well, the Torah teaches us not to hold a grudge against your brothers, to love your brothers, forgive your brothers. It teaches us clearly. And this is what Christ is saying. Might be a different wording. No, 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 no. He's, he's, wait, wait, hold on. Saying, because of my time. Again, he, wait, he again, makes a contrast. Again, wait, 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 wait. Because, wait, because, 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 because I don't want you. It's, it's my question time. You've answered to the point where I, but I want to be very specific so that you don't, you don't, you don't spend my time. Christ said it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So he's contrasting here. This law that applied to a particular thing, but he's saying, now, don't resist evil. If they slap you, not an eye for an eye now, but turn the other cheek. How does that make any sense in the light of your claim? That's what I'm asking. 
specifically an eye for an eye. And, and, yes. An eye for an eye is not Torah. It is in the prophets. All right. But I was saying to you that the Torah speaks about not only a grudge against thy people. All right. If you accept that, you don't. Then let's move on. Let's utilize time. Okay. Let's 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 move on. So um, I like to ask you this question. Now, what was the point in Christ pointing to the Pharisees who accused the disciples of, of, of you know, um, who were hungry and were picking grains on the Sabbath day? And they said, they said, oh, they are doing what's unlawful, just in case you want to look at it. That is um, Matthew 12, 1 to 7. And what Christ's response was, have you not read what, what David did? When he, when he and his companions were hungry, he entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to do, but only for the priests. Then he goes on to say, or oh, haven't you read in the law that the, the Sabbath, that the law on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are innocent. But I tell you, the greater than temple is here. How does this make sense in the light of your claim? What was the point Christ was trying to make by, was he encouraging them to break the Sabbath? Why was he speaking about David? breaking the law and the priest also breaking the sabbath and yet being innocent explain it to us i i can explain that crystal clear christ was showing them that they did not know the law christ showed them that david went into the tape into the temple and ate the bread that was only for the the priest but if you have men that are hungry before you then righteousness would offer you to give them that bread that's why christ said it is good to do good on the Sabbath, you're not adding that part. You're just trying to show that, oh, Christ is saying, Christ said it's good to do good on the Sabbath, showing you that you can feed people on the Sabbath, feed the hunger, and do these things. No, 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 no. That, that's not addressing my question. Why is Christ... I, I addressed it, brother. If you don't accept what I no, no. you know, then... No, okay. no, no, no. Because you're talking about doing good on the Sabbath. That's not the point. The point yes, is that yes, David... Yes. Wait, 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 wait. David went to do something that wasn't lawful to, for him to do. He was hungry. Why is, why is Christ justifying him, even though he broke the law? Because he was hungry. And it is good to do good on the Sabbath. If you have hungry people before you, you're going to say, no, I'm not going to feed you. This bread is for the priest. No, feed those that are hungry. That's why he said it is good to do good on the Sabbath. He didn't say don't keep the Sabbath. He said it is good to do good on the Sabbath. And he was showing that the scribes and the Pharisees of those days did not understand um, the weightier matters of the law. Okay, well, I disagree, but let me go on. Why did Christ... Yes, you can do that. That's fine. So what about the priests that he says they break the law on the Sabbath yet are innocent? They are innocent. You can do good. They can feed. They can, they can do sacrifices. All right, they can do sacrifice and these, these things that is commanded for them to do on the Sabbath day. All right, the day the people of, of the Second Temple time they had an understanding that you, you you couldn't do certain things on the Sabbath that was not according to the Torah, and Christ had to give them the proper understanding. Again, Christ did not say don't keep it, stop keeping it. Christ is simply showing them that you can eat on the Sabbath. If you he said if your mule fall into the pit on the Sabbath, you're gonna leave it in there or you're gonna pull it out. Okay, that, that, that's, that, that's fine. That, that's fine. I have another question. That's all right. How many minutes yeah, do I have, Josiah? Uh, Thirty seconds. Okay. Last question is this: What explain what Christ, what Paul meant when he says the law is not of faith? This is Galatians three eleven. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. Uh, the righteous one will live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, a person who performs them will live by them. What, what does it mean when Paul said the law is not of faith? Again, Paul was speaking concerning a particular law, not all the law. All right. I disagree, but that's okay. I yield my time. I think. Okay. It's... Thank you. Okay. That concludes the crop. Cross-examination, the final round is just for closing remarks for five minutes each, and then we'll have some Q&A. Um, Ed, when you're ready, five minutes for a closing statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, OJ. Please, please, from the bottom of my heart, allow me to apologize once again for the technical difficulty that was purely on my part. Um, but thank you, brothers, for working with me. 
and allowing me to be on. I know I got cut off and put on and cut off to get a little frustrating. I thank you, brothers, for your patience and thank um, you, brothers, for allowing me to be able to do this. And then again, it's to the listening audience. My brother put forward his case and I put forward my case. If you believe in your heart that you don't have to keep the laws, then don't keep them. All right. And you would see what judgment is brought before you. If you see that, again, I have shown that the, oh, the New Testament believers kept the law, taught the law, point back to the law, then keep God's law. All right. Because the scripture tells us this is the whole duty of man is to a fear God and to keep his commandments. Again, I thank you, brothers. I apologize for the technical difficulties, but thank you, brothers, for working with me to still be able to put this forward. Amen, and I yield the rest of the time. Thank you, Ed. We appreciate you participating tonight. Um, OJ, whenever you're ready, we have up to five minutes. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, okay, all right. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ed, too, for your time. Yes, I do understand you had um, some technical problems, and um, these things sometimes can be unavoided, so it's all right. Um, yeah, so I would just say uh, what we have seen in summary here is um, Ed, in my understanding, was not able to show any New Testament scriptures where believers were required to observe the Torah, whether by Torah I've already defined what we mean by Torah. I'm not saying that they were not they were not asked to observe the commandments of God. And remember, he said that, well, if I say all, we are no longer under the Torah, that all have been abolished. That means we could kill, steal, lie. And I would say again, it goes to show in my understanding that I don't believe that Eddie has a grasp and understanding of the new covenant. By saying we are not under the law of Moses or the Torah doesn't mean we are lawless. I don't know how many times I have to say that. It doesn't mean we are lawless. We are of we we are, we we are under the law of the Messiah, and by because by being under the law of the Messiah, by the Spirit of God, we fulfill the essence of the Torah, but we don't fulfill its rituals, which Eddie Ed is trying to say. If we don't keep the feasts, the new moons, the Sabbath, um, the, the the festivals, and all that, we we cannot be saved. And you know, Paul has, uh, uh, you know, he's spoken about the the danger in. In, in you know, trying to do that, Jesus even said we can't mix and uh, put new wine in old skin. That's it's gonna bust, you know. So um, again, we saw that there was no time he showed where the apostles said, apart from these four commandments, well, later we're going to introduce these other ones. They said no other burden apart from this, and they gave them whether they were quoting the Torah, it's irrelevant, okay. But the point is, they said they we clearly said. We'll put no other burden on you apart from these ones. That settles the matter. All right. Now he says, well, because they were quoting the Torah, that means we are to observe the Torah. That's not the point. Like I, like I explained, if you have a constitution that was in the 15th century, if America had a constitution that was in the 15th century, it doesn't matter whether some of the elements of that constitution remains in their present constitution. The point still remains that that constitution in the 15th century is null and void. Is void. We don't reference it. They don't reference it for anything. So if, if it doesn't matter, it's not and void. They have to refer to the new constitution, what they have. And that's the point we are making here, that the law of, of faith in Christ give, keeps us free from the law of sin and death. We see that, yes, Christ did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the essence of the law. And if anyone is in Christ, if you're led by the Spirit and you're in Christ, then you have been reconciled to God. Paul said what? Even I... Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 20. He said, I myself am not under the law. You know, he, he made it very clear. He said that I am I'm not under the law. Okay? But he's under the law of Christ. Galatians 3, 23. The law came, was only there temporarily. It is very explicit to introduce us to the real thing, which was Christ. So throughout this debate, you had Ed always subjectively dance around and choose which law he want, wanted it to be at each time. When the scriptures clearly says law, he makes it the sacrificial, only the sacrificial law, as he wills. You know, we also saw the scriptures clearly tells us those who seek to be justified by the law have fallen from grace. And in this regard, I really fear for my brother, Ed, because you cannot put old wine in new skin. And, and he says you've cut yourselves off from Christ. Christ will profit you nothing. It's not just about circumcision. If you're offending one, you're offending all. 
You can't say, well, I'm going to, it's okay for me not to circumcise because Paul said so, but I must observe the Sabbath. It doesn't work that way. You're still under condemnation because you're bound to the whole law, as the scriptures say. All right. However, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor circumcision has any value. All right. The Bible clearly tells us that the law, the change in the priesthood necessitated a change in the law. And we are now under the law of the liberty of Christ, where we walk by the spirit to fulfill the essence of the, 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 the law, not the letter. So at this point in time, I, I will yield my time and thank you That's all for good. listening. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again to both uh, participants, OJ and Ed. Let's do um, Q and the YouTube channel. So I'll, I'll end this broadcast and then the, um, the after show broadcast will start um, within a minute or two. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining. If you want to participate in the after show or watch that, um, come and join that. But um, I'll conclude this broadcast for the debate. Thank you. All right. Praise the Lord.